Hey everybody, I am really excited to talk about the book Insight. This is a really great book for every person because it talks about the importance of self-awareness. Self-awareness is a uniquely human quality, yet it's something very few of us truly have. Research has suggested that self-awareness is the number one variable of effective leadership. And research has shown that there's a direct relationship between a person's happiness and how self-aware they are. So really, self-awareness is critical for all of us. I actually can't think of any one skill that's more important for leaders or for people in general. Not only for what we practice and try to live out in our life, but for what we try to develop in other people. Imagine giving the gift of self-awareness to your children. Imagine if you're a teacher and having classrooms where self-awareness is practiced and nurtured. And imagine if you're a manager and you take the time to develop this within your team. This could make a huge difference for everybody's happiness and the way they live their lives. Self-awareness is defined as the ability to know oneself and be aware and conscious of how others see you. There are two categories of self-awareness, internal and external. Internal self-awareness is about knowing our inner landscape, our likes, our dislikes, our ambitions and feelings, our place in the world, and our impact on others. External self-awareness has to do with understanding how other people see us. It's the ability to look at ourselves from an outside perspective. You might be surprised to know that research shows very little relationship between internal and external self-awareness. That means just because you're good at one, you may not necessarily be good at the other. But people who have both internal and external self-awareness are able to make better decisions, have stronger professional and personal relationships, are more successful and more creative. So here's the good news. We can develop this. To be self-aware, Yurik suggests seven types of insight. The first insight is value. Our values are the things that are most important to us. They are the principles guiding how we live our lives. We have to be in touch with our values in order to be self-aware. The second insight is passion, which is what we love doing. And the third is aspirations, which is being in touch with what our goals are. Fit is the fourth insight, and this involves understanding which environment will make us the happiest, where we feel like we connect and we can thrive. Then there's the patterns. These are the behaviors and habits that make up our personality. This has to do with how we consistently think, feel, and act. Patterns are huge because we all have patterns and behaviors and patterns of thoughts, patterns of feeling. And in order to truly know ourselves, we have to know our patterns. The sixth insight has to do with our reactions, the emotional and physical behaviors that we exhibit in certain circumstances. For example, how we react under stress, how we react under pressure. And the final insight is impact. And that's knowing how our behavior affects others. So this probably sounds easy enough and somewhat intuitive. So why then is self-awareness so difficult? Well, in the book, she talks about three roadblocks to self-awareness. One is knowledge blindness. One is emotional blindness. And the third is behavioral blindness. Knowledge blindness occurs when we assess ourselves not on the way we actually perform, but based on the general beliefs we have about ourselves and our skills. So how does this show up? When people have expertise, they expect themselves to act in a certain way, perform at a certain level, usually at a higher level than the way they actually perform. You can probably imagine how this can get people in trouble. Being overconfident about our skills and our talents and not in touch with what we're really doing can create some problems. Emotional blindness is simply being oblivious to our own feelings. We call this living in our head and not being in touch with the heart. This is common because we still believe as a society that emotions don't have a legitimate place in our workplace or in our organizations. However, we are all full of emotion and not having an awareness around emotion does not make them go away. In fact, our emotions may creep up and show up when we're not expecting them to, especially if we are unaware of them. Behavior blindness is the final one and it's the inability to see your own behavior through the eyes of others. Sometimes we see ourselves more positively, thinking our behaviors have a more positive impact on others and we fail to see the negative. And other times, we may really be having a positive impact and not be able to see it, perhaps because we lack confidence or a strong sense of self. The book talks about Steve disease. This is a condition where people believe themselves to be smarter and funnier, thinner, better looking, more skilled than they actually are. You probably know people like this. It's very difficult to work with these kind of people. The Dunning-Kruger effect is another thing she talks about in the book, which says the least competent people tend to be the most confident about their abilities. These different effects are why self-awareness is so important. 
right? We don't want ourselves, the people on our team we're trying to lead, our children, our students, to have a disillusioned sense of self. It's really difficult to move through the world that way and will eventually catch up with you. Okay, so we come to the idea in the book of what she calls being braver but wiser. This is the decision and willingness to discover the truth about ourselves and establish a positive mindset and sense of self-acceptance. How can we do this, you might ask? Well, we can identify our assumptions, confront the assumptions that we have, and continue to learn. A key part of this is the ability to seek feedback from others. The process of being braver but wiser really is a process of introspection, but successful introspection requires a flexible mindset. We are complex human beings, and we may not find one answer. If we're curious, we can explore various perspectives about who we are and try to get some depth as we understand ourselves. One thing the book suggests is shifting away from the question why to the question of what. When we ask why we do things, our lazy brain will give us the most convenient answer and sometimes the simplest answer, but it's often an answer that reinforces forces our behaviors, even if those behaviors aren't helpful. But if we ask what kind of person we are, what kind of feelings are we feeling, what kind of actions are most common, we can begin to recognize them from a more curious place. At the core of mindfulness is awareness, which is why mindfulness is a critical skill for self-awareness. No doubt you've heard of mindfulness. It's somewhat of an organizational buzzword right now, but for a very good reason. Mindfulness works. And the good news is we can improve our ability to be mindful. The author suggests three ways to do this. The first technique is reframing. Reframing would be looking at the big picture of what happened and providing alternative explanations. For example, if you lose your job, you might stay fixated on what you lost. However, to reframe the experience, you could focus on what you gained. Right now, during this time of COVID and the pandemic, reframing is incredibly useful. Instead of only looking at the negatives from the situation, we can reframe the experience to recognize and identify opportunities and areas that have connected us to what's important in our life and what maybe we hadn't noticed before. Another technique is comparing and contrasting. Essentially, this technique asks us to look at how our behavior has changed or stayed the same over time. For example, if we've had several different relationships, but we always feel the same discontented and dissatisfied emotions, maybe the issue isn't the relationship or the other people, but an internal pattern in ourselves. If we're willing to look back and notice what has remained the same and what has changed over our life and our experiences, we can learn a great deal about ourselves. The final technique is a daily check-in practice. Just taking five minutes every day to reflect upon what went well, what could have been better, how you felt. It's a way of getting deeply connected to yourself and being willing to see and notice what's going on with you. Okay, let's move on to external awareness. I really like chapter seven, the truth we rarely hear. Because it's true, we rarely hear truths about ourselves. There are a couple of reasons for this. One is that people don't want to hurt other people's feelings. It's awkward and uncomfortable to deliver information that's hard to hear. And places where we're not our best self is not exciting to hear. The second reason is that we don't want to ask for feedback. So we just make excuses. We justify our behaviors that we know probably weren't the best reflection of ourselves. Or we convince ourselves that we don't need the feedback. The problem is knowing how other people view us is just as important as knowing how we view ourselves. But wait, there's more. We often don't ask for feedback because we think it's a sign of weakness, like it's somehow admitting an incompetence. But this is a bit of a paradox because research shows that leaders who ask for critical feedback are seen as more effective. Feedback really is holding up a mirror to ourselves and willing to look at what is shown. And that's hard, especially if what we see back isn't what we want to see, or if that picture, that reflection isn't as pretty as we thought it was. But here's my little plug here, right? Feedback's a gift, and there are people who truly want us to grow and be our best selves, and those are the people we need to be seeking feedback from. There are many people who just want to bring us down and give things and say things for their own gain or move their agenda forward. That's not the feedback we should be seeking. Hopefully, we all have our inner squad of people who can be honest with us and who we can be honest with in return. This is what we really need to truly grow our external self-awareness. Okay, so if we're ready to receive feedback, the book has a great chapter on how to actually take the feedback and do something with it that will help us increase our self-awareness. The first step is hearing it, not just listening to it, but really taking it in, being curious about it, seeing it as a gift for growth. 
But that is easier said than done because many of us, most of us in fact, have limiting self-beliefs. And when we get feedback about something that we did that needs to be better or improved upon, it can really cut us at our core and threaten our strong sense of self. So an important step is recognizing that this piece of feedback you're getting is only one part of who you are. It doesn't define your whole identity. Then there's another piece to this because we all have certain strengths and certain areas that we're not as good at. So while we can develop so many parts of ourselves, there may be some places that will continue to be an area for growth. So a part of self-awareness is admitting these. Nobody's perfect. Nobody expects anybody to be perfect, so being open about our flaws is a great way to acknowledge to others that we are aware. Once we do this, we can begin to take however many steps, big or small, that we need to improve upon ourselves. Okay, so we understand that true self-awareness involves not only knowing ourselves, but knowing what impact we have on others and how they perceive us. While this book is certainly geared toward leaders, self-awareness is a critical skill for all of us. And in many ways, self-awareness is a first step towards authenticity. And authenticity allows us to live fully and wholly as who we truly are. What I love about this book is that it doesn't ask us to be perfect or to grow in the places that we cannot grow. It asks us to begin a journey of knowing ourselves and it gives us a roadmap to do so.